Hey there guys, this is Richard, your host. The early 90s, <laughs> when Sega Genesis was the name on every gamer's lips, going head-to-head -head with the SNES and making Sega a household name. Those were the days, right? <laughs> but as the console wars heated up and the next generation loomed on the horizon, with Sony's PlayStation entering the fray and Nintendo's N64 just a stone's throw away, Sega aimed to keep the momentum going with the next big thing, the Sega Saturn. Expectations were sky high, and Sega, eager to make a splash, decided to surprise everyone with a sudden launch at E3, but instead of fireworks, it was more like a sparkler that went out too soon. Despite its really impressive tech and some truly innovative games, the Sega Saturn ended up being one of the company's less celebrated moments. Between a rocky development, lackluster third-party support, and a series of head-scratching decisions, the Saturn didn't just struggle, it became the beginning of the end for Sega as a console manufacturer. And while the Genesis and Dreamcast enjoy their spots in the gaming hall of fame, the Saturn lurks in the shadows, its legacy overshadowed by its siblings. But hold on, isn't there more to the Sega Saturn than meets the eye? <laughs> Absolutely! And that's why we're here today, to shine a spotlight on the top 40 underrated Sega Saturn games that showcase just how impressive this console truly was. Ready to be surprised by what you might have missed? Well, let's get started. Sonic R. We're starting strong with Sonic R, where Sonic and Tails are all set for a chill holiday. Just when they're about to let loose and relax, they spot an ad for a World Grand Prix. Sonic's interest didn't spark until he saw Dr. Robotnik's in on the mix, aiming to snatch the Chaos Emeralds to take over the world. Classic Robotnik, right? <laughs> so, Sonic's back in the game, alongside Knuckles and Amy, racing to beat Robotnik and his robotic squad to keep the Emeralds safe. It's racing, with a side of world saving. <laughs> a pretty cool setup for a 90s game. Now, Sonic R isn't your usual kart racer. Sure, it's got the multiplayer fun and item pickups like Mario Kart, but here's what seals the deal. You'll be sprinting on foot, or in Amy's case, driving. The game's got this unique vibe with exploration and jumping around, finding hidden paths and secrets in Sonic-themed tracks. It's kinda like combining a platformer with a racer, which is honestly a blast. And with characters like Sonic, Tails, Knuckles, and even Dr. Robotnik himself, each with their own quirks, it's a Sonic fan's dream. Back in the day, Sonic R was a mixed bag. The visuals and level design got some love, but um, the controls and the game's shortness didn't set well with everyone. And the soundtrack? <laughs> it's like pineapple on pizza. You either mm, love it or you don't. But over time, Sonic R has carved out its niche, especially among Sonic enthusiasts. Honestly, what makes Sonic R special is its charm. I mean, how the tracks are dripping with Sonic nostalgia, and the whole exploring to unlock secrets angle adds depth beyond just racing to the finish line. Plus, the game holds a special place as Sonic's main venture on the Sega Saturn. Virtua Fighter 2 Remix. Where do I even start with this next one? Virtua Fighter 2 is this game which dropped into arcades in 94 and made its way to the Sega Saturn a year later, blowing minds with what was at the time some of the most cutting edge graphics and fluid gameplay seen in a fighting game. The thing about Virtua Fighter 2 is it didn't really bother with a story in the game itself. It was all about the fight, the competition, but outside the game, in manuals and such, they spun this tale about the world's greatest fighters thrown into a tournament by the shadowy J6 Syndicate, aiming to create the ultimate fighter. Dural from what they learn. In the game, you've got this roster of fighters, each with their own distinct styles, like sumo wrestling, kung fu, <laughs> you name it, and you're duking it out in 3D arenas. The controls are tight, with a stick to move and just three buttons, but the depth comes from how you use those buttons. You could knock opponents out of the ring for a win, which was always a cheeky way to snag a victory. Plus, the game threw in these insanely detailed arenas that could be adjusted in size, and even let characters have infinite health for practice sessions or to set up those mock sumo bouts. And let's not forget about the new characters, Shandi and Lion Rafale, adding even more variety to the mix. This game was huge, a bona fide hit in arcades and on the Saturn. Critics couldn't get enough of its graphics, gameplay and those sweet, sweet 3D characters. It sold millions, becoming a must-have for the Saturn and even helped shift consoles off shelves when bundled with other hits. Reviewers praised everything from the game's deep combat system to its lifelike animation, thanks to early motion capture tech, and it racked up awards, including being named one of the best console games of its time. 
and the Dragoon Saga. So, there's this guy, Edge, right? Mm, just your average mercenary, chilling with his dragon, because, I don't know, why not? When he stumbles upon this mysterious girl, Hazel, from a civilization that's long gone. Things take a sharp turn when the Black Fleet swoops in, messes everything up, and sets Edge on a revenge path against their leader, Kraman. The plot thickens with ancient towers, sinister plans, and dragon battles. It's like stepping into a sci-fi epic where every discovery flips the script. Panzer Dragoon Saga flips the script on the series' classic rail shooter style, and I head first into RPG territory. You're exploring vast landscapes on your dragon, battling it out in a semi-turn-based combat, and walking around on foot to chat with NPCs or tweak your gear. The game simplifies the usual RPG fuss with minimal inventory headaches and a straightforward narrative that keeps you hooked without the endless grind. <laughs> the battles, well, they're this cool hybrid of real-time and turn-based mechanics, making every encounter feel dynamic and engaging. Despite being a technical marvel and critically adored, Panzer Dragoon Saga didn't exactly fly off the shelves, mainly because it dropped when Sega was already eyeing the Dreamcast. It's a shame, really, given how it pushed the Saturn to its limits with stunning graphics and an innovative combat system. Critics loved it for breaking the mold, offering a deep yet accessible RPG experience that stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with giants like Final Fantasy VII. The game's a masterclass in design, from its ethereal landscapes to the nuanced cinematic battles that keep you on the edge of your seat. And let's not forget the rarity factor. <laughs> Owning a copy today is like having a piece of gaming history. Despite its short length and the tragic backdrop of its development, and the Dragoon Saga remains a statement to what can be achieved with passion, creativity, and a little bit of technical wizardry. Nights into Dreams Imagine going into a world where your dreams and nightmares play out in vivid detail. Well, that's the gist of Nights into Dreams. You've got Elliot Edwards and Clarice Sinclair, two teens who end up in Nightopia, a place where human dreams converge. They team up with Knights, a rebel nightmarin with a heart to take down Wiseman, the big bad intent on wrecking both Nightopia and the real world. It's a wild, whimsical ride through the dreamscape, filled with challenges and a quest to restore peace and protect our dreams. Mm. Flying through dreams with Nights is quite entertaining. The game breaks down into seven levels of dreamy landscapes, each split between Elliot and Clarice, culminating in a shared final showdown. You start in basic dream worlds like Spring Valley and Splash Garden, racing against time to collect orbs and unleash Nights' full potential. The game plays a cool mix of 3D flying action with platformer vibes as you swoop, loop, and dash through obstacles, all while racking up points and grades like in school better. <laughs> Way more fun. There's also this neat A-Life system that adds a layer of depth, where the world evolves based on how you interact interact with its inhabitants, the Nightopians. No, it didn't sell like hotcakes everywhere, it became a cherished classic, especially among Saturn enthusiasts. Plus, it was so loved that it got an HD remake, and even a sequel, on the Wii. Sega Rally. Alright, so, Sega Rally doesn't exactly have a plot like an RPG or adventure game. It's all about the adrenaline of racing. Picture that you're behind the wheel of a rally car, tearing through dirt, mud, and asphalt across various picturesque landscapes. The whole vibe is about capturing the thrill of rally racing, competing against the clock or other drivers to prove you're the fastest out there. Sega Rally is known for its arcade-style handling and physics, making it super accessible but hard to master. You've got a selection of cars that handle differently, affecting how you tackle each track's unique challenges, from tight turns turns to slippery surfaces. Plus, the series introduced cool features like track deformation, where your car's tyres actually affect the terrain, changing how you and your opponents race. And let's not forget multiplayer racing. <laughs> Nothing beats the excitement of going head-to-head -head with friends. So, what are some of the games in the series? So far, we've seen five titles rev up the Sega Rally engine. It kicked off with the classic Sega Rally Championship, hitting the arcades before sliding onto the Sega Saturn and even PCs. Then came Sega Rally 2, amping up the excitement with more courses, and a Dreamcast release that well despite some hiccups, kept fans racing. Fast forward to Sega Rally 2006, a bit of a collector's item since it's a bit rarer, Sega Rally Revo with its shiny next-gen graphics, and finally Sega Rally 3, which took a lap back to arcades before hitting the consoles again as Sega Rally Online Arcade. The series has always pushed the envelope in visuals and gameplay, from groundbreaking graphics in the arcades to the innovative track deformation in Revo. Whether you're a die-hard fan from the 90s or a newcomer, Sega Rally offers a timeless racing experience that's always thrilling to dive in to
Daytona USA Arc RR. So, Daytona USA doesn't have a story or plot in the traditional sense, but imagine this. You're at the heart of the NASCAR fever, gripping the wheel of a beastly stock car. The Hornet. Your mission? Blast past a field of 39 rivals on some of the most iconic tracks inspired by real-life speedways. It's all about speed, skill, and beating the clock to emerge as the champion of the track. Daytona USA is the definition of arcade racing fun. You've got three tracks to conquer, ranging from the beginner-friendly 3.7 speedway to the technical twists of Dinosaur or Canyon and the ultimate test at Seaside Street Galaxy. The game's physics a top-notch, giving you that thrill of drifting through corners and mastering the perfect power slide. Plus, the force feedback on the steering wheel. <laughs> it makes every bump and scrape feel real. And with the H-Shifter, <laughs> you're in for a genuinely immersive racing experience. Whether you're flying solo or linking up cabinets for multiplayer mayhem, Daytona USA keeps you on the edgiest seat, especially with the adaptive difficulty that keeps races challenging but fair. When Daytona USA hit the arcades, it was a sensation. Critics and players alike were blown away by its groundbreaking graphics and fluid gameplay, not to mention the banging soundtrack. The transition to the Sega Saturn was met with praise, especially for the added modes and the depth they brought to the gameplay. However, there were some niggles about graphical issues and the missing multiplayer component, but that didn't stop it from being hailed as one of the best racing games of its time. The leap in technology with the Sega Model 2 system brought us one of the first games to feature such detailed 3D graphics and texture mapping, and the fact that this game sparked a competitive rivalry with Namco's Ridge Racer just adds to its legend. Even comparing it to console counterparts like Ridge Racer, Daytona USA held its own with its unique charm and gameplay. It's a timeless piece of arcade racing history that's just as exhilarating to play now as it was back in the 90s. Shining Force 3. Next up, we have Shining Force 3, which is this epic saga that's split into three parts. In the first part, you're following Symbios, this young lord from the Republic of Aspinia. Basically, Aspinia was like, oh, we're done with the Empire of Destonia's nonsense, and they split. But of course, there's tension and border disputes, because splitting up is never that easy. Symbios ends up in this peace conference that goes south real fast, thanks to some shady cult action, and bam, eh, you're in the middle of a war again. Then there's Scenario 2, with Prince Medion of Destonia, who's trying to figure out what's really going on beneath all this conflict. And finally, Scenario 3 focuses on Julian, a mercenary with a vendetta against this powerful vandal, Garm, who he thinks killed his dad. The story twists and turns with betrayals, alliances, and a final showdown that's all about stopping a big bad from wrecking everything. Shining Force 3 is like the classic tactical RPG, but with twists that might sweep you off your feet. You've got this chessboard-style battle system where each of your units moves around, deciding whether to attack, cast spells, or use items based on their position. It's all turn-based, with outcomes influenced by how speedy your characters are. Leveling up and getting stronger is a big part of the game, and you can even promote your characters to beefier classes once they hit certain levels. But what's cool is that even if you get knocked down in battle, well, there's no game over. You keep your XP, making your squad stronger for the next round. Plus, characters can become BFFs on the battlefield, <laughs> boosting their stats when they fight side by side. The game was a hit with those who played it, scoring high with critics like GameSpot and RPG Fan, even snagging some love from Retro Retro Gamer Magazine. It's praised as a solid addition to the tactical RPG genre, but it kind of flew under the radar because it dropped late in the Sega Saturn's life cycle. Hmm. Despite that, fans have gone to great lengths to translate the unreleased scenarios, showing just how much love there is for this game. And let's not forget the dedication of its fan community, who speaks volumes about its impact and legacy. In a way, it's a hidden gem that's cherished by those who have experienced its full, expansive adventure. Guardian Heroes. Next, we have Guardian Heroes for you, which is like the video game equivalent of a rock concert mashed with a fantasy epic. Developed by Treasure and hitting the Sega Saturn in 1996, this game took the beat-em-up formula, threw in a hefty dose of RPG magic, and cranked it up to 11. <laughs> Imagine Final Fight or Golden Axe, but with a fun new look that lets you decide the fate of the universe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's that cool. So, the plot's pretty wild. Picture a universe created by a top-notch supreme being on the lookout for some ultimate warriors. Q, a massive showdown between Earth and Sky Spirits, humans caught in the middle, then BAM! Humans get ditched into darkness with the Earth Spirits. Yeah. Fast forward, and humans are all about that sword life, but wizard cunners like, <laughs> let's shake things up, and tries to monopolize magic. Enter our heroes, Han, Randy, Nicole, Injiro, and Serena, with a legendary sword and a zombie warrior on the side, ready to challenge Cannon and maybe even take on the creator of the universe itself. 
gameplay wise, Guardian Heroes is not your average stroll through enemy hordes. You get to choose your path through the story, impacting how things unfold and who you end up scrapping with, leading to a whole bunch of different endings. Your choices even affect your karma meter, which is pretty neat. And let's talk about leveling up. Between brawls, you get to beef up your characters across six different stats, from strength to luck, making your squad more badass as you go. But wait, there's more. There's a versus mode, where up to six players can throw down in an all-out brawl, picking from the main cast or even some of the bosses and civilians you meet. Whether you're duking it out in story mode or beating down your buddies in versus, Guardian Heroes ensures the action never stops. The reception? Well, people dug it. The mix of both beat-em-up action and RPG elements, not to mention the killer soundtrack and that unique ability to shape the story, turned Guardian's Heroes into a cult classic. It's one of those games that's remembered not just for how fun it is to play, but for how it flipped the script on traditional genre boundaries. Magic Knight Ray Earth. Next, let me tell you about this wild ride called Magic Knight Ray Earth. So, Hikaru, Umi, and Fu are these girls with different vibes. Tomboy, the cool-headed one, and the smarty. They're thrown into this quest to save Princess Emerald from the bad guy, Zagato. Things get real when they find out the princess is actually in love with Zagato, and this whole mission they're on, well, it's way more complicated than just a simple rescue. Fast forward, and after some intense battles and moral dilemmas, they realize the system they're fighting to protect might be flawed. Hmm. The second part gets even deeper, with the girls facing the aftermath of their actions and questioning the whole one person holding the fate of the world deal. If you're going into any of the Magic Knight Ray Earth games, expect to jump into an adventure where you're solving puzzles, casting spells, and engaging in some epic battles. The gameplay typically involves navigating through Sephiro, unleashing your magic against foes, and maybe even strategizing in those mecha fights. It's all about embodying these three girls, using their unique abilities, and pushing through the challenges of saving a world that's both beautiful and broken. This one's been a hit, especially outside Japan. Dark Horse Comics and Tokyo Pop have seen some solid sales in the US, proving that Hikaru, Umi, and Fu's journey resonates with a lot of fans. Plus, the story doesn't shy away from getting deep, tackling themes of responsibility, the cost of power, and what it means to make tough choices. Hmm, this one's a game that sticks with you long after the adventure ends. Golden Axe The Duel Golden Axe The Duel is this fantasy-themed fighter that Sega dropped back in 95. So, how does the story go? Well, after the dust settled from their last showdown with Death Adder, Gilius Thunderhead's legendary axe, yeah, the one that delivered the final blow, is back in the spotlight. Except, now it's not just about defeating evil. It's got powers that have everyone wanting a piece of it. Cue in a roster of ten warriors, all hyped to get their hands on this magical weapon. If you've ever jammed on a fighting game, <laughs> you'll get the gist. Two characters face off, each with their unique movesets and a shared goal to knock the health bar of the other into oblivion. <laughs> but wait, mm, there has to be some sort of twist, right? Yeah. The potion dropping imp mechanic. This little guy flies around, dropping potions that power up your super moves, adding a layer of strategy and chaos to each duel. It's like, do you go for the potion and risk getting hit, or do you play it safe and possibly miss out on unleashing a game-changing super move? Hmm. The critics were kind of mixed on this one. Sega Saturn magazine was vibing with it, highlighting the solid port from arcade to Sega Saturn, those nifty potions, top notch graphics and tunes, but not everyone was on board. Electronic Gaming Monthly and others felt it was just another fighter in a sea of 2D throwdowns, with graphics that didn't really set it apart from the pack. And then there's the issue of originality, like uh, it seemed to some critics that the game didn't bring enough new stuff to the table, making it feel a bit dated, even at launch. And let's not forget, for fans of the series, seeking a new take on the Golden Axe universe was a treat. It might not have been the groundbreaking fighter of the 90s, but for those who dug the franchise and loved the idea of stepping back into that world for a brawl, well, it had its moments. Plus, in an era filled with fighting games, having one set in a beloved fantasy universe definitely gave it a cool edge. Oh. Fighters Megamix. Fighters Megamix is a total mashup masterpiece that Sega dropped for the Sega Saturn in 96. Think of it as a party where all your favorite fighters from Sega's 3D arcade hits like Virtua Fighter 2 and Fighting Vipers crash into each other. There's not much of a storyline going on here. Imagine the bear mascot Kuma Chan throwing down against Virtua Fighter Legends. It's as wild as it sounds. This game is like a buffet of fighting styles. You've got nine different modes, including a novice trial for beginners and tracks dedicated to Virtua Fighter, Fighting Vipers, and even one 
one for the ladies and muscle-bound characters. The game lets you switch up the fighting style between the open rings of Virtua Fighter minus the ring outs and the closed cages of fighting vipers, so it kind of feels like you're getting two games in one. Plus, the Virtua Fighter characters come with new moves from Virtua Fighter 3, adding some fresh tactics to the mix. Critics were all over this game, praising its deep roster and innovative crossover concept. Game Informer went as far as to say it was pretty much the best thing on the Saturn, and GameSpot hinted it was a good enough reason to buy the console. Although the graphics got a bit of flack for not living up to Virtua Fighter 2 standards, and, and some folks found the AI a bit on the easy side, the unique matchup possibilities and sheer variety of characters and styles more than made up for it. It wasn't just a hit with reviewers, it sold like hotcakes, especially in Japan. <laughs> Puzzle Fighter 2 Turbo Super Puzzle Fighter 2 Turbo <laughs> This game's a total gem in the console's library. It took that wacky, competitive puzzle concept Capcom nailed in the arcades and brought it home with all of its charm intact. Gameplay-wise, you're still juggling those brightly coloured gems, aiming to group them together and waiting for the perfect moment to drop a crash gem and set off a chain reaction. The counter gems mechanic adds this spicy layer of strategy where you're not just playing your board, but also playing against your opponents. The bigger your combos, the more you mess with their side of the screen. <laughs> and let's not forget about the diamond piece that appears every 25 turns, acting like a wild card to clear gems and potentially turn the tide of a match. What's cool about the Saturn version is how faithful it feels to the arcade experience. It captures that intense puzzle battle vibe with the added comfort of your own couch and no need to hoard quarters. The graphics pop, the music's catchy, and it's just pure addictive fun. Gamers who picked this up for the Saturn were in for a treat. It was hailed for its addictive gameplay and how it perfectly transitioned from arcade to home console. The quirky mashup of Capcom fighting characters in a puzzle game setting was fresh, and the game quickly earned its spot as a must-have for puzzle and fighting game fans alike. Shining the Holy Ark Shining the Holy Ark? Right. This is a Sega Saturn classic from 97 that took the Shining series into a fresh direction with a mix of polygons and sprites. The story kicks off with a classic mercenary gig gone sideways. Arthur, Melody and Forte are out to nab a rogue ninja, Rody, when suddenly, BAM! A mysterious craft crashes and they're all smacked with spirit possession. <laughs> the plot thickens with twists of good versus evil spirits, ancient kingdoms and the struggle to prevent a world of darkness. It sets the stage for Shining. Shining Force 3, linking characters and tales in a way that's got a deeper vibe aimed at adult fans. Coming to the gameplay now, it's like cruising through dungeons and towns from a first-person view, but it's not like you're freely wandering. No, it's more of a step-by-step -step journey, making every move and turn more deliberate. You've got a crew of up to four characters with you, ready to swap in and out as the battles heat up, and these battles, totally random and turn-based, giving you that old-school RPG feel with a neat first-person perspective during fights. The game spices things up with a pixie system, where you collect these little helpers like fairies or leprechauns that can give you an edge by attacking enemies right as encounters start. Plus, navigating towns is a breather, since you won't bump into any battles there, allowing you to gear up and just chill. Critics and players dug it for the most part, it was applauded for its graphical style. The battles and the added depth from the pixie system caught a lot of positive attention too. Despite some finding the story a tad predictable, the overall package was considered solid RPG gold for the Saturn, and the game's approach to storytelling, <laughs> with its adult targeted narrative and ties to the broader Shining series lore offered a richer backdrop than many expected. Definitely a gem in the Saturn's crown. Burning Rangers Burning Rangers is this hidden gem from 98 on the Sega Saturn. Picture a future where fires are the last big danger to society. You're part of this elite squad of firefighters called the Burning Rangers. Your mission? Dive into infernos, save civilians, and keep the flames at bay. It's a fresh take on the action genre, where you're saving lives instead of taking them. Plus, you're snagging energy crystals from the fires you extinguish to teleport civilians to safety, which is pretty darn cool. Burning Rangers shakes things up with a third-person perspective, focusing on dousing fires and pulling off daring rescues in these futuristic settings like space stations and underwater habitats. You've got this jetpack to zip around, perform acrobatics, and even tackle underwater sections. The game throws you into four levels of firefighting action, ending each with a boss battle that ranges from robotic fish to fire-breathing flora. Instead of a traditional map, you get voice navigation to guide you through the levels, which was pretty innovative for its time. Critics were digging Burning Ranger. The lighting effects got a shout-out for being top-notch, though some reviews weren't fans of the collision detection and the occasional glitch. 
Village. Mm. Despite its flaws, it's considered one of the Saturn's swan songs and praised for its unique concept and execution. However, the short game length and the not-so-challenging difficulty curve were points of contention for some. Saturn Bomberman Saturn Bomberman is like the party game before party games were even a thing. Released by Hudson Soft for the Sega Saturn in the late 90s, it's basically a must-have if you're into blowing stuff up with friends. It cranked up the multiplayer madness to 10. <laughs> Literally, you could have up to 10 people playing at once, which was pretty mind-blowing back then. Here, you've got your classic battle mode, a story mode for solo or duo play, and this master mode where you're racing against the clock through a series of levels. The game throws in these cool dinosaur helpers, starting off as eggs and then growing up as you collect more power-ups. The bigger the dino, the bigger the advantage, as they take the hit instead of you. And in battle mode, it's all out chaos with up to 10 players duking it out in arenas. Honestly, the sheer scale of multiplayer here is just epic. Not many games back then let you and nine of your buddies all throw down in the same game. Plus, the dinosaur helpers added a fun twist to the classic Bomberman formula. The game snagged some pretty solid scores across the board, especially for how it handles multiplayer. Though some felt it didn't really push the series into new territory, the consensus was that if you're, well, throwing a Saturn party, Saturn Bomberman needs to be on the playlist. Die Hard Arcade Arc R R Die Hard Arcade or Dynamite Daker in Japan is this rad beat 'em up game that dropped for the Sega Saturn. The story straight out of an action flick. You're gonna go into a high rise to rescue the president's daughter from terrorists. As you punch, kick, and blast your way through the levels, you'll face off against quirky bosses like a grenade-toting fire chief and laser-firing spider bots. And in a twist, right at the end, if both players make it through, they throw down against each other for the ultimate glory of winning the president's daughter's gratitude. Mm. Imagine yourself as either. John McClane or Chris Thompson, or their Japanese counterparts Bruno Dellinger and Cindy Holiday, going full throttle against waves of baddies. You're not just throwing fists and kicks, you're grabbing whatever you can find, from brooms to missile launchers, and making it work for you. And get this, you can combine items to craft even more epic weapons, like turning a spray can into a flamethrower. The game mixes up the brawling with quick time events, pushing you to stay on your toes if you don't want to lose health or get dragged into more fights. Plus, if you're tag teaming with a buddy, you can pull off some sweet combined moves and Combos. The Saturn port was praised for staying true to the arcade's vibe. While some folks wished for more depth or variety, the consensus was that Die Hard Arcade brought the heat. The biggest gripes were about the game's length and difficulty. Apparently, it was a bit on the easy side and could be wrapped up pretty quickly, especially if you had some skills. All in all, this game was a trailblazer for using texture map 3D polygon graphics and a beat em up, making it look slick for its time. Fighting Vipers, Ark RR. Coming up next is Fighting Vipers. Think of it as VF's edgier cousin with a twist. Launched in arcades in 95 and then hitting the Sega Saturn, it was all about bringing that arcade fight home. The game's got a vibe that's a bit more in your face, set in the US with characters that feel like they've just stepped out of a 90s action flick. You've got your basics, guard, punch, kick, but Fighting Vipers cranks it up with arenas you can't escape because of walls. These walls aren't just for show. You can slam foes into them, or if you're feeling spicy, smash right through them. Then there's the armor mechanic. Everyone's decked out in it, and you can literally knock it off your opponents to make them easier to beat down. It added a whole layer to the strategy because you're not just aiming to land hits, you're aiming to break the defenses first. Characters in the game? <laughs> Wild. There's Barn, this teen looking to throw down with his long lost dad, and Candy. <laughs> She's fighting in a fairy costume she designed. Then you've got a skater kid, a rocker with a flying V guitar, and even a dude named Sandman who's all about the number three. The roster's like a 90s action movie cast, over the top and ready to rumble. In the arcade, it was the hot ticket in Japan, but didn't quite catch fire in North American arcades. However, the Saturn port got some solid mods for keeping the adrenaline of the arcade intact, especially praising how it brought the game's dynamic animations and lighting effects home. Critics dug the unique mechanics like armor breaking and the whole deal with walls adding more depth to the fights, but it wasn't all perfect. Some thought the character designs were a bit out there, and others felt it was in the shadow of Virtua Fighter 2.
Panzer Dragoon 1. Panzer Dragoon is this iconic rail shooter that landed on the Sega Saturn back in 95, developed by the legends over at Sega's Team Andromeda. The story dives deep into a world where humanity is clinging to survival thousands of years after a catastrophic war. Kiel's adventure starts when he stumbles upon an ancient ruin and ends up bonding with a dragon, taking on a mission to stop the ominous black dragon from reaching this sinister tower. It's a tale of discovery, betrayal, and battling against the odds, all told through in-game cutscenes that keep you hooked from start to finish. Coming to the gameplay now, you'll be soaring through these stunning 3D landscapes on a predetermined path, but you've got full control over this aiming reticle to blast away at foes coming at you from every angle. It's not just about spamming that fire button, you've got to dodge, weave, and choose between using your dragon's homing lasers or Kiel's gun for quick shots. The game is packed with six levels of intense action, including boss battles that will test your reflexes and strategy. Plus, there's this neat mechanic where you can look in all directions, front, back, left, right, to catch enemies trying to sneak up on you. Critics loved how it mixed fast-paced shooting action with a captivating storyline, though some noted the game wasn't pushing any new boundaries in terms of gameplay mechanics. And let's not forget it was one of the first games to really show off what the Sega Saturn was capable of graphically. Despite its somewhat on-rails nature, it managed to deliver a thrilling experience that's remembered fondly to this day. Plus, it sparked a series that continued to evolve, adding depth to the intriguing world it introduced. Panzer Dragoon 2. Panzer Dragoon 2 Zwei is like the prequel nobody knew they needed until it landed on the Sega Saturn in 96. Developed by Sega's Team Andromeda, this rail shooter takes you back before the original Panzer Dragoon, introducing you to Lundy and his dragon buddy Lagi as they chase down a mysterious airship from the ancient age. Set before the first game, Zwei has you uncovering parts of the Panzer Dragoon world's lore, following Lundy's quest to avenge his village destroyed by the airship Shelkoof. Along the way, Lundy discovers Lagi's true potential, leading to some epic showdowns, including a climactic battle against a dragon born from Shell Koof itself. The tales rich with themes of friendship, destiny, and the eternal struggle against oppressive forces, all delivered with cinematic flair. Speaking of the gameplay now, your job here is to aim and blast away at all sorts of enemies using Lundy's gun or Lagi's lock-on lasers. Think of it like being on a roller coaster with a blaster in hand. <laughs> you can't change the track, but you can definitely affect the ride. The game throws in branching paths in several levels, meaning your choices impact which enemies you face and how your dragon evolves over time. And get this, the dragon morphs into stronger forms based on your performance, adding a sweet RPG element to the shooter vibes. It snagged high scores for its super extensive world, branching paths, adding to its replay value, and a soundtrack that perfectly matched the game's epic scope. The evolving dragon mechanic isn't just cool, it gives players a tangible sense of progression and customization. And with a remake on the horizon, it's clear that Panzer Dragoon 2's Vi's legacy is as enduring as the ancient ruins that dot its fantastical landscape. Dragon Force. Dragon Force hit the Sega Saturn back in 96 and caught everyone's attention with its charm, partly because you could have these massive battles with up to 200 soldiers throwing down on screen at the same time. Imagine the chaos and strategy of something like Braveheart but in video game form. In a world where ancient gods have left behind their powerful weapons and creatures, Dragon Force follows the story of eight monarchs who find themselves embroiled in conflict, manipulated by darker forces seeking to unleash an ancient evil. As the game unfolds, you discover that your ruler is part of the legendary Dragon Force, destined to battle the resurgent Dark God. The narrative branches depending on which ruler you pick, offering multiple perspectives on the unfolding chaos. Coming to the gameplay, you're thrown into the shoes of one of eight rulers in the land of Legendra, each with their own crew of generals and armies. The goal? Navigate through the world, capturing towns and castles, and going head-to-head -head with armies from rival nations. Battles kick off in real time, and you've got to make quick decisions on whether to attack, parley, or beat a hasty retreat. The battles themselves are a sight to behold with hundreds of troops clashing in these epic showdowns. Plus, the game throws in some RPG goodness, allowing you to level up your generals, recruit new ones, and even persuade enemies to join your course. We're talking up to 200 units on the screen at once, which was mind-blowing at the time and remains impressive. The game managed to balance these massive clashes with a deep narrative, giving each ruler and a general a backstory that added weight to every conflict. It's a game that not only tested your strategic thinking, but also pulled you into its world, making it one of the Saturn standout titles and a must-play for fans of the genre.
Three Dirty Dwarves. Three Dirty Dwarves is this quirky beat-em-up that hit the Sega Saturn back in 96. The different than usual vibe of the game is what sets it apart from your average brawler. Imagine controlling three dwarves with a penchant for mayhem, battling through levels filled with all sorts of bizarre enemies. Sega even had plans to bring it to the PlayStation, but that never panned out, and the dwarves stayed put on the Saturn and PC. The game kicks off with four child geniuses, created by the army, who'd rather play role-playing games than be soldiers. They somehow summon their in-game dwarves characters to the real world to escape from General Briggs, the bad guy wanting to use their brains for weaponry. The dwarves' gear burns up on entry, so they arm themselves with sporting goods as weapons. <laughs> it's a bonkers ride as they fight through monsters from their game world, aiming to rescue the kids and take down Briggs. Gameplay-wise, you and up to two buddies can jump into the action, each controlling one of the dwarves. If you're flying solo or with just another player, you can switch between the dwarves on the fly. The gameplay sticks to the beat em up formula, but throws in some cool tricks. The dwarves pack both short-range and long-range attacks. Plus, you can revive a knocked-out dwarf by giving them a good whack. <laughs> Talk about tough love. Ouch. The game spices things up with team attacks and power-ups you collect by smashing open crates or picking up skulls from defeated foes. Electronic Gaming Monthly got a kick out of the game's zany cutscenes and the overall fun factor. Next Generation appreciated the effort to spice up the somewhat stale genre, noting the game's varied levels and solid challenge. However, not everyone was sold, with Sega Saturn Magazine finding the humor more irritating than amusing and criticizing the gameplay for being repetitive. Mm. The Legend of Oasis The Legend of Oasis is another action RPG gem from 96 that dropped on the Sega Saturn. Developed by Ancient, it's both a sequel and a prequel to Beyond Oasis on the Mega Drive, Genesis. In this installment, you've got young Leon trying to live up to his mentor Auden's expectations by becoming the Spirit King of Oasis. But with the Jito wreaking havoc with the Silver Armlet, it's up to Leon to get the elemental spirits on his side and put an end to Ajito's plans. It's all about real-time action in this game. Leon's got a pretty sick arsenal, with each weapon bringing its own special moves to the table that you pull off like you're playing a fighting game. But the real deal is the elemental spirits. Summon them by shooting a spirit ball at stuff, and depending on what you hit, you'll get different spirit buddies popping out to lend a hand. They do everything from squaring up against enemies, healing Leon, to even helping you puzzle your way through the game. And yes, Leon's packing some serious combo moves, and even a bow and arrow for those pesky out-of-reach switches. The game got a warm welcome from critics, snagging props for its crisp graphics, solid controls, and the way it mixes action, puzzles and RPG goodness into one entertaining package. Though some players grumbled about the tricky platform heights, overall, the challenge and the blend of genres seem to hit the right note. It might have faced some criticism for not pushing enough boundaries compared to its predecessor, but for Saturn owners, it was a slice of action RPG goodness that wasn't to be missed. Bulk Slash. Coming in hot is Bulk Slash, which is this rad mecha action game that dropped on the Sega Saturn back in 97, developed by Cap Productions and brought to us by Hudson Soft. In the game, you're Crest Dawley, the SDF's hotshot pilot fighting against Alwar Gardona's plan to seize control over Blau. The story weaves in childhood friends turned foes and allies, like Rizen Ravia, who's joined the dark side because of her past, and a cast of other characters ranging from SDF soldiers to galactic idols. The game's chock full of weapons to blast enemies into a oblivion, from bombs to who knows what else, giving you the freedom to tackle air and ground targets with style. Plus, there's this cool feature called the Manageable Intelligence Support System, where you can recruit female navigators hidden in levels, each bringing their own special skills to the table. These navigators level up as you play, influencing the game's ending based on their experience points. Cap Production is the brains behind the game, known for their work on titles like Agane, The Final Conflict, giving it a unique look reminiscent of Donkey Kong Country. Review has praised the game for making the most out of the Saturn's hard Hardware, pointing out the slick 3D visuals and smooth gameplay. It's been called a must-play for Saturn enthusiasts, noted for its replayability and which showcases what the Saturn could do graphically. The game might have flown under the radar for many, but it's a hidden gem that Saturn diehards and mecha fans alike should definitely check out. Cyber Speedway. Cyber Speedway, known as Grand Chaser in Japan, is this cool future-themed hover sled racing game that landed on the Sega Saturn back in 95. Developed by Next Tech and sporting vehicle designs by the legendary Sid Mead, it's got that sleek cybernetic vibe going on. The game sets up this scenario, where instead of duking it out in wars, civilizations across the galaxy race in their cyber race to settle their scores, and you're Earth's chosen driver, aiming to dominate the championship. The heart of the game is its story mode, where you climb up from being Earth's representative to taking on 
the galaxy's best in a series of races. The goal? Finish first in each race, or it's game over. You get to rip around these high-speed tracks, lasting through five laps per race, with the added twist of having missiles to knock your rivals back a peg or two. Plus, it nods to Cyber Race, a computer game from 93, with both titles sharing a futuristic racing theme. Sega Saturn magazine took a jab at the physics, saying the lack of traction didn't really mesh with how you'd expect a hovercraft to zip around, and Maximum magazine wasn't thrilled with the hovercraft concept altogether, calling the gameplay predictable and a bit dull. Over in the US, GamePro felt the game was a blast, but flagged it for not having enough to keep players coming back, pointing to easy-to-master tracks and some less-than-stellar cinematics in story mode that didn't do much for replay value. However, Next Generation magazine, reviewing the Japanese import, called it good fun, despite not being top-tier. Even if the gameplay mechanics received some critique, a split-screen multiplayer option was a hit, offering Saturn owners a decent alternative to the solo racing scene. It might not have taken the crown for best racer out there, but Cyber Speedway managed to carve out its own niche in the Sega Saturn's lineup. Ballora Valley Golf Ballora Valley Golf, or as it's known in Japan, the Hyper Golf Devil's Course, is this quirky take on golf that hit the Sega Saturn, cooked up by T&D Soft and served by Vic Tokai. Forget about your granddad's golf game, this one cranks up the wackiness to 11. Imagine smacking your golf ball over lava pits or aiming for a green perched atop a mountain like it's just another Sunday round. It's golf, but not as we know it. You've got your standard golf game setup where you're dealing with the usual suspects like water hazards and sand traps, but then it throws you for a loop with these over-the-top elements, like who expects to deal with a volcano mid-game. Hmm. The courses run the gamut from your basic pristine fairways where you can absolutely unleash on the ball, driving at a whopping 450 yards, to more fantastical settings like ancient ruins or, yeah, even inside a volcano. The controls keep it simple, a few clicks to set up your shot, choosing the angle and the power. And if you nail the end of the meter just right, you get to pull off some special shots that add a bit of flair to your game. No name-brand golfers or famous courses here, just pure, unadulterated fantasy golf. The simplicity of the controls means you're not bogged down with overly complex mechanics, making it accessible to anyone who just wants to have a fun, albeit unconventional, round of golf. So, if you ever fantasized about teeing off in the middle of a volcano without the risk of, well, you know, actual lava burns, Ballora Valley Golf is your ticket to a wild ride on the greens. Virtual On Cyber Troopers Virtual On Cyber Troopers, or as it's known in the cool circles, a mashup of mechs, mayhem, and 90s arcade vibes. Sega decided to throw robots into an arena and said, let's make them fight, um, but in 3D. And bam! This gem was born in 1996. It's like your typical Saturday night brawl, except everyone's a giant robot with guns and swords. Gameplay-wise, it's all about strategy and reflexes. You've got to outmaneuver and outgun your opponent across various arenas. Each mech, or Virtuaroid, comes with its own own arsenal, including a main weapon, a sidearm, and a special attack that's pretty much the Hail Mary of robot combat. Whether you're dashing, jumping, or going prone, it's all about making those shots count and looking cool while doing it. Back in the day, gamers and critics were pretty divided. Some saw it as this innovative mix of shooting and fighting that brought something fresh to arcades and living rooms alike. The 3D movement, the strategic combat, the fact that robots were duking it out, it was all pretty groundbreaking. Plus, the Saturn version was praised for being a faithful arcade port, which wasn't always a given back then. And let's not forget the dedicated twin-stick controller for the Saturn, a move that was both bold and kinda bonkers, considering it was pretty much for this game alone. Clockwork Knight 2. Clockwork Knight 2 picks right up where the first game left us hanging. Chelsea, the toy princess, is safe but still snoozing away, and just when the toy gang figures out their next move, she gets nabbed again. Our hero, Pepper, is back on the rescue mission, key sword in hand and ready to jump, run and bash through everything in his path to save her again. Gameplay-wise, if you've jammed on the first Clockwork Knight, well, you'll slide right into this one. It's like meeting an old friend, but they've got new jokes. You're still hopping through rooms, but now there's a twist with these playing cards you've got to collect for a secret code code, and some levels where you're on a forced march, riding your trusty steed, Barobaro. And there's this cool bit where you race against Le Bon for gold keys or chase down Prunchow for a mega gear boost. Plus, for folks in the US, there's this bosses galore mode, where you can throw down against all the bosses back to back. Now, onto what people thought about it. Many people were 
pretty jazzed, saying it's a big step up from the original. They're all about the Uncharted replay value and how the pacing feels just right this time, and that bus's galore mode, chef's kiss for letting you relive all the epic showdowns, plus unlocking some neat extras. Those hidden cards and secrets have folks digging through every nook and cranny, but it wasn't all confetti and cheers. Some pointed out it's still on the short side, and if uh, you're looking for a hardcore challenge, this might not crank your gears to the max. Gundam Gaiden 3 Mobile Suit Gundam Side Story 3 Sabakureshi Mono is like hopping back into your favorite cockpit for one last ride. This game wraps up the trilogy with a bang, and it's clear from the get-go that Sega wasn't just going through the motions for this finale. So, the plot picks up with our heroes in a bit of a bind. They thought they had a moment to breathe, but nope, Chelsea gets kidnapped again. Classic, right? It's like, come on, can we catch a break here? But no time for breaks in Gundam Land. It's straight back into the fray. Gameplay-wise, if you've been along for the first two parts of this space opera, you'll feel right at home. You've got the same mission setup, the same cockpit view you've come to know and love, but with some slick upgrades. They've sprinkled in some new bits like these collectible cards that unlock a secret code, and some missions where you're doing more than just blasting away. There's this bit where you've got to protect data centers from all angles, and it forces you to play smarter, not harder. It's not about just shooting, it's about shooting smartly. Now, let's talk about those graphics. Even though they were pushing this game out after just a few months, the visuals got a nice bump. We're talking better models, textures, and yes, snow. It might not be a game changer, but it's enough to make you appreciate the attention to detail, especially when you're duking it out in the snow with camoed up enemy suits. But what really stands out is the final mission. It's just you and the big bad. You can get out in space with everything on the line. And for this showdown, they tweak the controls just enough to keep it fresh without throwing you off your game. It's the kind of finale that makes the whole journey worth it. Darius Gaiden. Darius Gaiden is this slick horizontal scrolling shooter from 94 that took arcades by storm before landing on consoles like the Sega Saturn and PlayStation. You're in control of the Silver Hawk, a starship on a mission to save planet Darius from the clutches of the Belsar Empire. It's like you're the galaxy's last hope against these sea creature themed baddies, from fish to crabs, all wanting to make sushi out of the human race. Game plays a blast with Darius Gaiden. It sticks to the shoot 'em up roots but spices things up with some cool features. You've got these black hole bombs that vacuum up enemies in their fire. Plus, you can capture mid-level bosses to fight alongside you. How cool is that? And with 27 stages to pick from in a non-linear fashion, it never gets old because you're only ever playing seven in a run. The power-up system's pretty straightforward. Grab colored emblems from downed foes to beef up your ship with better firepower, shields, or missiles. It scored awards left and right, with everyone praising its gameplay, branching levels, and the visuals that really showed off what Tato's new F3 system arcade board could do. But the soundtrack, that was a hit or miss. Some found its eccentric tunes a bit out there, while others thought it added to the game's unique charm. And let's not forget the difficulty. Some said it was just right, offering a solid challenge without being unfair, while others thought it cranked the frustration up a bit too high. Whether you were blasting through levels in arcades or taking on the Belsar Empire from your couch, Darius Gaiden was, and still is, a must-play for fans of the genre and those branching paths. They meant every playthrough could be a whole new adventure, making it a game you'd gladly sink hours into without a second thought. Galactic Attack. Galactic Attack is this rat shoot -em up that made its way from the arcades to the Sega Saturn, thanks to Taito in Japan and acclaim elsewhere. Originally hitting the scene as Ray Force, this game is a blast from the past with a twist. So, the gist of the plot isn't something you'll need to sit down and analyze. It's pretty much what you'd expect from a high-octane shooter. You're the pilot of a spacecraft tasked with saving the day by blasting through enemies across various levels. The game doesn't lay it on thick with story details, but who needs a novel when you've got lasers? Galactic Attack brings something pretty neat to the table with its dual plane action. You've got enemies coming at you in the air and on the ground. To deal with this, you're equipped with two types of weapons, a standard blaster for airborne foes and a lock-on laser for ground targets. The cool part is how many enemies you can lock onto depends on how many power-ups you snag along the way. Boss fights mix it up, challenging you to figure out which weapon works best for taking them down. It's all about strategy and quick reflexes. But here's where it gets interesting. The game supports tape mode. If you're not familiar, that means you can rotate your screen 90 degrees to play the game vertically, just like in the arcades. It's a game-changer for the immersion factor, making Galactic Attack stand out in the home console landscape. Plus, you can hide the HUD with a button press for an unobstructed view of the carnage. <laughs> Fancy, right?
Wing arms. Wing arms hit the Sega Saturn back in 95, and trust me when I tell you this, it's not your typical flight sim. You'll get a quirky alternate history vibe happening post-World War II, where the shady corporation Avalon is trying to keep the war flames burning for profit. So you're part of this squad on the USS Enterprise, rocking both Allied and Axis planes to take down Avalon's latest threats. Kinda wild, right? Gameplay-wise, it's pretty chill. You get to pick from seven different planes, each with its own specs like speed and armor, and they're all decked out with rockets. Missions are straightforward. Get your objectives from the Admiral and go blow stuff up. Planes, bases, yeah, you name it. And there's a cool ranking system that lets you climb the ranks from second lieutenant to colonel based on your performance. Plus, you've got three lives, credits, to keep you in the game if things go south. Now, on to reception. It's a bit of a mixed bag. Some folks at Electronic Gaming Monthly thought it was a top-notch flight sim, while others were a bit more critical, especially about the AI and how tough it gets later on. Sega Saturn Magazine and GamePro dug the mission variety and the controls but they weren't fans of the unrealistic unlimited ammo in the plane's durability. Then there's Maximum and Next Generation pointing out the game's decent but not groundbreaking gameplay, and the pop-up issues with graphics in later levels. However, they did appreciate the old-school dogfighting feel, even if the game's on the shorter side. So, if you're into a more laid-back flight experience with a dash of historical what-if, Wing Arms is definitely worth checking out. Shinobi Legions. Shinobi Legions for the Sega Saturn? Haha, <laughs> blast! This game's a part of the Shinobi series, and it dropped back in 95. It's got this side-scrolling hack and slash vibe that'll definitely remind you of the older Shinobi games, especially Shinobi 3. But here's the thing, it leans heavily into katana action over shurikens, giving you that authentic ninja feel. The story kicks off with a bit of family drama. We've got two brothers, Kazuma and Sho, and their buddy Aya being groomed to carry the ninja torch. Fast forward 15 years, and Kazuma's gone rogue, obsessed with power. He kidnaps Aya to lure Sho into a trap, setting the stage for some epic showdowns. Gameplay-wise, it's classic, but with a fresh coat of paint. You play a Sho, slicing through enemies and overcoming obstacles. Forget about those ninjutsu techniques from the past games. Yeah, this time, you're picking up items for power-ups or temporary special abilities, like a massive sword or a clone shield. And keep an eye out for those blue orbs. They're your ticket to extra lives. The critics were pretty divided about this. Bamitsu gave it a solid score, while GamePro was all about pushing you off the fence to grab a Saturn for this game alone. They dug the defensive moves and the variety of enemies. Electronic Gaming Monthly and Next Generation had some mixed feelings about the FMV cutscenes and whether it truly felt like a shinobi game, but they couldn't deny it was fun and looked slick. Sega Saturn Magazine, though, wasn't blown away, calling it a bit of a missed opportunity to really showcase the Saturn's power. So, what stands out? Honestly, it's the blend of nostalgia with some new take. The shift to katana-centric combat gives it a fresh feel, and the digitized sprite graphics are a cool departure from the more common polygon look of the year. Plus, those FMV cutscenes, whether you love them or hate them, definitely give the game its own unique flavour. Crypt Killer. Crypt Killer is a game that Konami dropped in 95 for arcades and then hit the Sega Saturn and PlayStation a couple of years later. Now, about the plot, it's pretty wild. You're guided by the spirit named Galazon, a floating head who's all about sending you through these themed caves and crypts. The goal is to find those eyes of guidance, but of course, it's uh, never that simple. The journey's packed with twists, and depending on how you mix and match the eyes you collect, you unlock different endings, from finding real treasure to directing a movie based on your adventures, or even getting a bad ending where all your loot turns out to be fake. Mm. Gameplay is pretty straightforward, but in a fun way. It's a light gun shooter, where you're on rails, moving through levels filled with all sorts of monsters. At certain points, you get to choose your path, which adds a bit of spice to the whole adventure. You can start on any of the six levels, and there's a boss fight waiting at the end of each, guarding those precious eyes of guidance. Plus, there's the chance to upgrade your firepower with hidden weapons like a Gatling gun or a grenade launcher. The console versions throw in a neat twist with bombs that can wipe the screen clean of enemies. Reception? Well, it wasn't all roses. The game got some flack for its graphics, which were a bit rough around the edges and for not really making the enemies feel all that scary. The pixelated and blocky look, combined with some cheap hits and over-the-top acrobatics made the gameplay feel a bit disorienting, and it didn't sit well with reviewers. Sega Saturn Magazine and Electronic Gaming Monthly weren't thrilled, pointing out these flaws and even suggesting you'd have more fun using the Virtua Gun for anything but playing the game. Yet there was a glimmer of appreciation for its unique mythical theme amidst the sea of criticism. It's one of those games that, well, despite its flaws, has a certain charm if you're into retro gaming and don't mind a bit of a bumpy ride. <laughs> D 
Deep Fear. Deep Fear, one of the Sega Saturn swan songs from 1998. It's a bit of a hidden gem, especially since it never made its way to North America. The plot thickens when a space capsule crashes into the Pacific, bringing with it a rather unwelcome guest to the big table facility. Between fighting off mutants and uncovering the source of the infection, you've got a full plate. The story has its twists, with the cold you're nursing somehow keeping you safe from the infection, and a chimpanzee named Anthony being the key to everything. <laughs> it gets wild. Gameplay is your typical survival horror fare, but with a unique underwater deal. You've got to manage air supplies on top of dealing with all these mutated creatures. The environments are pre-rendered, which gives the game a certain eerie vibe, and you're looking at everything through fixed camera angles, very Resident Evil-esque. There are guns and special weapons to find, and combat has you juggling between shooting mutants and conserving air, which adds a whole new layer of tension. Reception was all over the place. Some loved the music and the game's unique take on the survival horror formula, raising its underwater setting and the whole managing air supply mechanic. Others were less kind, calling it out for its graphics and voice acting, which, <laughs> let's just say, wasn't winning any awards. But the game did find its fans, especially those looking for something different from the usual Resident Evil-style game. Robotica. Next up, we have Robotica, which is also known as Robotica Cybernation Revolt in Europe and Daedalus in Japan. This game is a first-person shooter that dropped on the Sega Saturn back in 95 and has this whole futuristic rebellion theme going on. The plot is straight out of a sci-fi novel. It's the year 2877, and the World Silent Security Service, WSSS, has been keeping peace in space and on Earth for centuries. However, with its original creators long gone, people start doubting its rule, leading to a massive rebellion. You're piloting one of the advanced Laocorn class assault robots sent on a mission to take down the central control station Daedalus, but things go sideways fast, leaving you as the sole survivor against an army of robots. Speaking of the gameplay now, well, you're exploring through 30 floors of Daedalus, looking to destroy its core. The floors are randomly generated, which adds a bit of unpredictability to your mission. You've got to find key cards to advance, seek out and destroy reactors on some levels, and deal with a variety of enemies trying to stop you. Your Laocorn mech comes equipped with an armory of weapons and some pretty cool abilities like hovering and a plasma barrier, but watch out for kamikaze enemies that can downgrade your weapons. Electronic Gaming Monthly gave it props for its graphics, storyline and strategic combat depth, calling it one of the best FPS games at the time, but others like Sega Saturn Magazine and Game Pro felt it was a bit of a nice waste of time, criticising it for dull gameplay and monotonous visuals. The general consensus seemed to be that it lacked the excitement and variety needed to stand out in the genre. The strategic element of managing your mech's abilities and weapons, along with the randomness of the levels, gave it a unique flair. However, it struggled to fully deliver a compelling experience, largely due to the repetitive level design and underwhelming enemy variety. Despite its ambitions, Robotica ended up being overshadowed by other titles on the Saturn, remembered more for its potential than its execution. But if you're into retro gaming and have a soft spot for sci-fi and mechs, it might just be worth a look for the novelty alone. Scud, the Disposable Assassin. Scud, the Disposable Assassin on the Sega Saturn launched in March 97, and honestly, it's a real trip, especially if you're into the comic book series it's based on. Rob Schraub, the creator, even mentioned it does his characters justice, which is pretty cool, right? The story is pretty cool too. You've got Scud, this robotic assassin from the Heartbreaker series, and his crew, including Drywall, this oddball character who's basically a walking storage unit, and Susudio, a bounty hunter who initially wants Scud's head. It's like a comic book, sprung to life. Gameplay is also super versatile. You can go classic with the Saturn gamepad, or ramp up the experience with the Saturn stunner light gun. Fancy dual wielding? Well, there's a mode for that, emulating Scud's signature style. Plus, if you stumble upon drywall, he becomes playable, unlocking a two-player mode that can mix and match controls. Critics dug the graphics, mentioning they're packed with detail and humour. The idea of having three modes with different controls was seen as original, but the novelty didn't fully translate into depth. While some modes, especially the dual wielding, were praised for being fun, the Overall gameplay was tagged as repetitive and too straightforward for some tastes. The reviewers were divided on the music. Some thought it was awesome and fitting for the shoot 'em up action, while others couldn't vibe with it, calling it everything from corny to headache inducing. It's one of those games that might not have hit every mark, but brought enough novelty to be remembered as a noble failure. Plus, having a soundtrack that ranges from kick ass to cottage cheese quality FMV, it's a mixed bag that's part comic, part game, and, and all over the entertainment map.
Shinobi X. Shinobi X is basically the European makeover of Shinobi Legions. It hit the scene a bit later than expected in 95, thanks to Sega Europe wanting to give the game's tunes a bit of a remix. The man behind the music revamp was none other than Richard Jack, known for his knack for catchy video game beats. He aimed to channel the vibe of Yuzo Koshiro's iconic The Revenge of Shinobi score, which is no small feat considering Koshiro's legendary status in the gaming music world. So, the big take for the European fans was all in the soundtrack. While the in-game jams got the Japanese treatment, the cutscene tracks were left as they were, giving players a mix of the new and the nostalgic. This change was somewhat reminiscent of what Sega of America did with Sonic CD, opting to switch up the music for a regional release. As for the plot and gameplay, Shinobi X stuck to its roots, delivering the action-packed side-scrolling ninja adventure that fans of the series love. The North American version, dropped by Vic Tokai earlier that same year, kept the original music, making the European release unique with its soundtrack alterations. The decision to tweak the music for Shinobi X's European release was a bold move. Music plays a huge role in setting the tone and atmosphere of a game, especially in a series as storied as Shinobi. Richard Jack stepping in to add his touch, aiming to pay homage to Yuzo Koshiro's work, highlights the importance of music in video games. It's these kind of changes that can make regional versions of games stand out, offering a different experience even when the core game remains the same. So, if you're a fan of the series or a video game music aficionado, Shinobi X's European version offers a unique twist worth checking out. Stellar Assault SS. Stellar Assault, or Shadow Squadron, depending on where you're from, is this game which is a gem on the Sega 32X, and it even got an enhanced port to the Sega Saturn later on. So, how does the plot go? Well, say you're in the future. The year's not specified, but there's been a coup in the colonial star system of Cyvus. The rebel army's causing chaos, demanding surrender from the Allied forces. When the good guys refuse, the rebels bombard the capital planet, Ladiria, with meteors using something called the Accelerator Gate. It's pretty dire. So, the Allied forces with out their top secret feather fighters to take the battle to the rebels and save the day. Gameplay is all about that 3D space combat life, reminding me a bit of Star Wars Arcade. You get to pilot one of two feather fighter ships across six missions, blasting through space and taking down the enemy. You've got the agile Feather 1, decked out with guided lasers, and the tankier Feather 2, which packs a heavier punch but relies on manual targeting. Feather 2 even has an autopilot feature for a more relaxed shoot 'em up experience. Or you can go co-op with a buddy, one flying, the other shooting. The whole game is rendered in this retro flat-shaded 3D polygon style. Your main targets are fighter and carrier ships, and you've got a strategic display before each mission to plan your attack. The controls let you dive, dodge, and roll through space with ease. Plus, you can switch between first-person and third-person views to get the best angle on the action. Your ships come with a couple of energy types, one for weapons and engines, the other for shields. Managing these is key, especially since Feather 2 doesn't recharge its weapon energy between missions. And if you get blown up, you've got a few continues to try again. Beat the game, and you unlock a trace option to watch a replay of your last playthrough. There's even a bit of customization with difficulty settings and the option to change your ship's colors. Not to mention, the weapon system is pretty cool, with Feather 1's semi-guided lasers and Feather 2's manual heavy laser and energy torpedoes. Dragon Ball Z Shin Butoden Dragon Ball Z Shin Butoden for the Sega Saturn is a game that slid into the scene back in 95. Developed by Tozi and tossed into the world by Bandai, this game took the essence of the Dragon Ball franchise and packed it into a one-on-one -on -one fighter that fans of the Super Butoden subseries would find pretty familiar. The setup classic Dragon Ball Z with epic battles, special moves galore, and a roster that includes fan favorites like Goku, Vegeta, and even the less fearsome Mr. Satan, who gets his own gameplay mode. Yep, you heard that right. There's a mode where you can step into the shoes of Mr. Satan, hustling to pay off his debts through rigged fights, banana peels, and all. Gameplay is what you'd expect from a DBZ fighter. Face-offs in a variety of modes including story, versus, and the unique Mr. Satan mode. Characters can zip around, charging their chi to unleash devastating attacks, the game sporting a mix of 22 playable fighters and their transformations. What's really cool about Shin Butoden is the split-screen feature that kicks in when fighters distance themselves, a nice touch to keep both players in the action without losing sight of the characters. Plus, the the option to customize controls means you can tweak your playstyle just the way you like it. As for how it was received, well, it was a mixed bag. The game got some props for its character lineup and the variety of modes, especially that quirky Mr. Satan adventure. However, the graphics and animations didn't wow everyone, and the game didn't quite showcase the Sega Saturn's capabilities to the fullest, but still, it's a win for its time. It sold a decent number of copies in Japan, but opinions varied widely among critics. Some praised the depth and variety it offered, while others felt it fell short compared to other DBZ titles, especially 
particularly in terms of balance and playability. <laughs> Final Fight Revenge Last but not least on the list is Final Fight Revenge. This one's a bit of an oddball in the Final Fight universe. Dropped in 99, it's this 3D fighter that kinda breaks the mold by being a one-on-one -on -one brawl fest instead of the classic beat-em-up style that we're all used to. Capcom really went left field with this one, making it the only one-on-one -on -one fighter in the series. It's got our favourite heroes like Mike Hagar, Cody and Guy throwing down against the Mad Gear gang members. Originally, it hit the arcades on Sega Saturn-based hardware, then made a home landing in Japan on the Saturn in 2000. There was some chatter about a Dreamcast version, but that dream got squashed. The roster's a nostalgic callback with 10 fighters pulled straight from the original Final Fight. We're talking about the good guys and the notorious Mad Gear bosses all ready to duke it out. Each character brings a slice of their history to the fight, with some even carrying over moves from the Street Fighter Alpha series. The single player mode tosses you into the ring against a lineup of six AI opponents, culminating in a showdown against a zombified version of Belgia. Yep, you heard that right. Zombie Belgia is the final boss. Coming to the gameplay, Final Fight Revenge sticks to a pretty standard fighting game setup with five buttons and joystick, but here's the kicker. It added a special button into the mix. This nifty button lets you sidestep into the foreground or background, dodge attacks, or scoop up weapons and health items off the ground. Weapons? Yeah, you can arm yourself with anything from knives to flamethrowers, storing up to three weapons to switch up your battle strategy. And of course, it's a Capcom fighter, so you've got those signature grappling moves, special moves and flashy super moves to fill up your gauge and unleash havoc. If you're curious about this quirky chapter in the series or just then it for the novelty, it's definitely worth a look. Marvelous verdict, and there you have it. Our journey through the top 40 underrated Sega Saturn games, a console that truly deserved more time in the limelight. From the high-speed thrills of Sonic R in Daytona USA, to the deep immersive worlds of Panzer Dragoon Saga and Shining Force 3, the Saturn offered a diverse library of titles that pushed the boundaries of what we expected from video games. Games like Knights into Dreams and Sega Rally showcased the Saturn's unique capabilities, while Guardian Heroes and Magic Knight Ray Earth provided experiences you couldn't find anywhere else. As we look back, it's clear that the Sega Saturn's library was ahead of its time. So, whether you're a long-time Saturn enthusiast or a newcomer curious about Sega's storied past, there's never been a better time to explore these underrated classics. The Sega Saturn may have been a shooting star in the console wars of the 90s, but its legacy burns brighter than ever, reminding us of the magic of video gaming and the endless possibilities that lie within a simple disc. That's it for today, and make sure to like this video and comment your favourite Saturn gem that deserves a lot of praise but somehow didn't make it out of the underrated radar. Until next time, fellas.